So the important thing about this slide is that you have my email there. And if anybody knows me, I try to be pretty good at responding to all emails. So feel free if something uh, is not complete, something you have a question, um, just email me and I'll, and I'll respond sooner or later. Usually sooner, believe it or not. Okay, so I have to pass this slide um, I, and uh, I have to, it's a rule in my department, but let's skip over it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to be doing today, I'm going to be talking about three distinct types of psychotherapies and I'm, that emphasize culture. So this classification system is based on how we see culture. So that's really what I'm going to try to emphasize. I know there's many different types of classifications. They're all wonderful. Well, some of them are wonderful. Um, but I'm going to emphasize this one because it has more to do with what we are interested in. And then I'm going to try to describe uh, what I'm calling now a more global cultural psychotherapeutic model. And then uh, and this I'm going to focus more at the, en at the end in, in the workshop mostly. Uh, I'm going to be talking about specific ways to translate these ideas into specific interventions. I don't know, but when I was in, in classes in cross-cultural psychology and in multicultural, it all sounded really good. But then when I had to sit down and I had to really figure something specific, it wasn't very clear to me. So that's what I'm going to be trying to do in the workshop more than here. Or, uh, right now, I'm going to be talking more about some of the general principles and ideas. So the three models of psychotherapy that I'm going to be talking about are the individualistic, relational, and contextual kind of psychotherapies. The individualistic model focuses more on the patient uh, and doesn't emphasize so much uh, the context or the psychotherapeutic relationship. And I would say that much of our, uh, many of our interventions currently are very individualistic in that they emphasize, for example, things like self-esteem, self-efficacy, uh, self-actualization, individuation, ego strengths, and the list goes on and on. It's so many different, so many different uh, treatment goals are based on, the, on trying to improve the individual and we often don't focus much on the psychotherapeutic relationship or the cultural context. And uh, I think it's many of these uh, evident, and many of these interventions have been informed, thank God, by a lot of rigorous objective uh, information uh, that has helped us develop uh, really wonderful strategies to more effectively intervene and help people. And I think that because of these interventions, and you know, here I'm talking about individualistic psychotherapies, it sounds a little bit, but no, they have done a lot of wonderful good. They have, because of them, we have been able to come a long way and we have helped hundreds of thousands of people who would have otherwise not received the help that require. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened uh, after, for example, uh, the empirical supported treatment movement started is that they emphasized this also the need to include race and ethnicity. And I think that was an important inclusion because it allowed us to start looking more carefully into that. Before this, and particularly before the NIH mandate to measure race and ethnicity in all um, uh, NIH-funded research, it was, it was not included. Uh, Ray, every, all the research was basically based, uh, it was assessed with uh, white middle-class people. And after this, we started looking more into, into race and ethnicity, which I think is a significant uh, improvement. And uh, I and I think that one of the reasons why we started looking more into race and ethnicity is because it's kind of easy to, to measure. With a couple of questions, we can get a, an idea of what the race is. And, 
we have increasingly been finding that it does have an, uh, uh, has an impact in the outcome. One of the most relevant studies um, as, that I would say is a landmark study is uh, the 1977 Stanley Sue uh, study. What he found is that he, he reviewed all the information, all the outcome data in California, uh, and what he did is he basically assessed to see how many ethnic minorities would return to a second appointment. How many do you think would return? 50%. You got it. Very good. <laughs> how many uh, whites would return to a second appointment with a white clinician? 50%. No. <laughs> with a white, a white clinician and a white, you know, uh, we're treating a white, a white client, 80%. So the difference is dramatic, it's significant. And this allowed us to finally start looking at the impact that race and ethnicity has. And it has allowed us to start developing wonderful, culturally adapted interventions to address these differences in psychotherapy. So that's, so, so because, and, and the culturally competence model also started because of this. And I'm gonna explain much more about this in one, in one minute. Um, the other important thing is that it was realized at that point that there was not enough ethnic minority psychologists, mental health providers. And these, fun, uh, these findings really encourage um, NIH and many other institutions to see how much, there, how many, how much uh, disparity there was in the field. So I think there was a lot of advance because of these findings. The second psychotherapeutic model that I like emphasizing is what I call the relational psychotherapies. That they underscore psychotherapy as a process between the patient and the therapist. It's not only what's hap it's not only that the patient is the only one making decisions. The therapist also also very involved in both of them um, interact in such a way that uh, it, uh, the relationship has a significant um, impact in the outcome of the psychotherapy. And I think that research is beginning to find that the psychotherapeutic relationship does in fact have a significant impact um, in the outcome of therapy. And that's increasingly more what we're beginning to find. Uh, qualitative re research has also emphasized qualitative uh, methods, so we need to see how the researcher or the clinician is also impacting the patient or the subject. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, they're beginning to find that the relationship is more uh, uh, than just, uh, the, uh, the relationship is a significant factor uh, that predicts the outcome of psychotherapy. But the other important thing that I want to emphasize is that um, culture is defined more broadly. And it include, it's not only about your race or your ethnicity, it's also of the way you make sense of the world. So it's not that uh, because you are um, of a particular, particular skin color, then you're gonna have uh, specific attributes. It's the way you make sense of things that really matters. So this, I think it's one of the most important innovations that has allowed us to refine further uh, the research on uh, culturally, uh, culturally competence. And um, I think that culture is much broader, as I said, than, um, than race and ethnicity. And it makes it, um, and we, what this means is that we need to assess how people make sense of their culture. Not because I'm Latino, um, I'm gonna be late to all appointments. I'm never late. <laughs> right? But when you read a book on cross-cultural psychology, you read the fact, oh, Latinos are, you gotta talk about time because they tend to be late. Um, they, you know, it's, you have all these stereotypes that really not necessarily apply 
to everybody. So I'm asking you to ask people how they make sense of their culture, uh, what, how to understand it, and I'm gonna give you uh, one of the most important uh, meanings that people make, uh, which, uh, which is uh, self-orientation. Self-orientation is the most studied cultural variable ever. As it's like uh, in the cultural literature, it has been researched. Uh, um, I think that, it, for example, in the Journal of Cultural Psychology, 25% of uh, all research uh, includes, in one way or the other, self-orientation, which is the way in which we make sense of ourselves and the world. There's two basic but not independent uh, uh, basic self-orientations. One is uh, individual, individualism or idiocentrism, and the other one is uh, collectivism or allocentrism. Uh, these are not uh, independent, so you can be high in both or low in the middle, or, or, or you can be in the, in the middle. So it's important to understand uh, that there is a lot of variation. But overall, it has been found that Asians, for example, tend to be overall much more allocentric, uh, more, much, much more relational, as well as Latinos, while white Americans and African Americans tend to be a little bit more individualistic in general. And I hate having to say this, like in, I repeat in general, but uh, it's not everybody. So I wanted to kind of find a way to see how refining these meanings could actually uh, make psychotherapy more effective. So I looked for something that could be very specific that I could measure, that I could assess. And what I, but I decided and that I could assess uh, for uh, levels of allocentrism and idiocentrism. And what I did was um, uh, I used relaxation. So, I developed two types of relaxation, one that was more individualistic and the other one that was more relational. The individualistic relaxation uh, was imagine yourself in a beautiful beach, and this is in winter in Boston. <laughs> I loved it. I, I, would, I love doing this exercise. Imagine yourself in the, in the beach, uh, 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 breathe deeply the air of the ocean, and, uh, and imagine all, your, all by yourself and that's the key, all by yourself. Um, when I did the relational one, was the same exact thing, but using, uh, but with significant, imagine yourself in the beach with uh, your loved ones, your significant other ones, you feel safe, you feel happy, you feel, uh, you breathe the air. Everything was different for except that. And I administer it through, administer both to a group of Latinos, and, and this is what I found. Overall, um, overall the Latinos uh, were, as the literature reports, very allocentric. That's what everybody does. But, some, but not all of them. There were a lot of them who were more, more individualistic, uh, and, that, and that was important. And what we found is that there was a significant relationship. The more relational they were, the more allocentric they were, the more they used the relational um, relaxation exercise. And, and the similarly, the same thing. And I'm not gonna go into the, the, the specifics of the study, but the same thing was an individualistic strategy. And we found, and this is, I think, was really important, that the more they practice, the more uh, the, the anxiety ca came down, and the more, and as well as their depression. So, and so this is just a, just a little, little thing, changing the intervention, um, making it more sensitive to, to make, to match their characteristics, and just doing that, we found a significant effect that, uh, that people prefer using one type of relaxation rather than another one. And that had an effect on the depression and anxiety level significantly. And not only that, uh, since they were more able to manage their feelings, uh, their anxiety levels, 
they went to the ER less frequently. And not only that, they, start, they, used, uh, they stopped using a certain cycle of uh, some medications that they no longer needed because they were feeling better. So we not only, with this little modification in, the, in, in our intervention, we were able to make it more sensitive to who they were, which allowed them to have less anxiety, less depression, less pain, and we saved a ton of money. So they were very happy with us. And that's like the basic I idea. If you make interventions that match who they are, it doesn't have to be, it has, doesn't have to be necessarily because of the skin color, it's how they define themselves, then we can help them more efficiently. They practice more when they match. You know, it's not many times they don't, and you know, with one of the things that Sue found is that they were not coming in because we were not giving them what they wanted. But when they do get what they want, they stay in treatment and they benefit more from it. So this is a lot of what really cultural uh, uh, competence is, providing people with what they need. And, and this, I was telling you about the relaxation exercise. Well, let the psychotherapy literature is filled with examples of, of little gaps like this that could have a significant impact. What I would like to do right now is, for example, work with the dollhouses. The other day, one of my students left an extra dollhouse in the office. And uh, when my patients came, he, he, he started playing with both, with both dollhouses. And it was so rich because it was, he was going from one house to the other, and I was getting so much information about what was going on between them. And it, it, it was just very, very illustrative. Many times we just assume the family is a nuclear family, uh, and therefore uh, a dollhouse will, just one dollhouse doll will capture it. Well, um, sometimes uh, those of us who come from families who are not, not who are very broad, uh, very extended, know that it, it, it's, Families can be, sometimes it's many different families together. The third approach that, I'm talk, that I want to talk about is the contextual psychotherapies. And uh, the main premise is that the meanings we make uh, are connected, uh, are interrelated, or only have sense within specific context. We cannot, uh, we cannot understand the meanings of our behaviors if we are in a different context. We need to put into account uh, what's going on. And uh, what, there's a lab at MIT that's doing some amazing research that I really like. And for example, what they have, what they have found, uh, if you have read some of the big data studies, is that uh, people often um, vote or purchase things not so much for what they say or what they believe, but where they live uh, or with who uh, they interact. It's the context that seems to have a lot, a lot of more influence on what we do, not only, uh, not, not only our meanings, but also where we are. And this is the third variable that I'm so glad that today, when I was hearing the previous presenters, uh, they were emphasizing how the community is so relevant and so important. Because if we don't take into account the, the, the community, we will be missing a big part of what's going on. So a lot of what I'm going to be doing is talking about, about that, um, how to do that. So culture is often understood uh, uh, as something uh, for these approaches that it's within the context. And we all know, for example, um, we, when we see a study, they all include socioeconomic status, they're increasingly inc inc including levels of education or violence. And I think all this is very important information that comes from this type of mo uh, model. One variable that I think it's increasingly more important is actually uh, some, uh, something that has not been talked too much about, which is implicit, what I'm calling implicit processes. Um, uh, explicit processes are those 
that people are aware of and that people uh, do so voluntarily, while implicit are those that we do uh, in, without knowing and we're not aware of. And uh, much of our experience in society, it's actually in, very much implicit. We learn so many things in this society of how we should act, how we should interact, so we don't have to think about many other things. We just can be, uh, we can have one set of data in our minds and then just be in autopilot uh, while we respond to the other things. But many of these um, scripts to be in autopilot are based on prevalent cultural assumptions. And uh, they, these, uh, when we don't look at them, we just tend to replicate them and repeat them over and over. And then um, we may do damage to people uh, without even knowing, okay? For example, uh, some people tend to get closer. Um, it's the way they connect when they interact. And some, I heard therapists, oh, he got so close to me. Um, he must be borderline or, 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 you heard that one, right? Well, it could also be cultural that some people just try to get a little bit more closer. And I think um, there is, a, have you heard about the implicit association test? Yeah, you should. And if, uh, it's, it's very important. What they're finding uh, is that when you do this implicit association test, what, what it does is actually you see some slides and because of your reaction time, you can kind of uh, see how, um, how much bias you have against one group or, or not. And what they're finding is that the implicit association test is more predictive than self-reports on, on, on many different behaviors, on many uh, uh, indicators of, of our behavior. So I think it's, it's a very important kind of measure that also needs to be taken into account. Why am I talking about implicit processes right now? Because many of these are hammered by the context. They're repeated over and over, and they become a way uh, that we kind of absorb what's going on in the culture, and we just repeat them over, over, over and over. Have you, uh, it's important also in this literature to look at microaggressions. I think it's becoming more and more relevant. There's a beautiful classic study by Steele and Arison, um, the stereotype threat. If you, if, uh, uh, if you have not looked at it, please do. It, what they basically did is they had a group of African Americans uh, take a test, and so they knew the scores, and then they divided them in half, and they repeated the same test a few months later. Obviously, the, uh, you would expect that you would get this, basically the same scores, which is what happened on the first group. The second group, um, they, were, um, they were asked to have, uh, to self-identify as African Americans, and uh, just doing that before the exam uh, reduced the, the uh, performance on the test significantly. And uh, it's just a reminder how we are constantly bombarded by messages of how some groups are less than others. It's something that's happening all the time, constantly. And it's not only a traumatic event, it's an ongoing uh, perpetual event that is happening more in some particular times. Um, I'm not gonna mention which, but it's uh, important to, to see how uh, these um, ongoing uh, bombardments can have an effect on people. Um, there was a, a beautiful issue in the American psychologists about trauma and ethnic minorities, and one of the things they found uh, consistently is that many ethnic minorities report significantly more trauma, and partly uh, because they, they experience significantly more assaults on, the, on their well-being. 
So what does this mean, just uh, mentioning about implicit processes, is that we need to explore that their impact in the psychotherapeutic relationship. We need to see how they are affecting it. And secondly, and this hasn't happened, this is what, what I'm trying to encourage more and more, is that we need to include implicit uh, uh, assessments into our studies. When I look into the cultural literature, I didn't find almost any um, in psychotherapy. And I think it has a lot, a lot of uh, possibilities that we need to start exploring. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how does this relate, how do th these three approaches relate with what I'm talking about, which is um, cultural psychotherapy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And, uh, no? It's back? Okay, it's back. <laughs> so the first implication is that we all have a culture, okay? When it's culture, it's not the domain of ethnic minorities. Cult we all have a specific background that has an effect on our lives, has an effect on who we are, and has an effect in psychotherapy. And, we, and it's, it's important to kind of understand that. Sometimes in classes I've asked students, um, uh, so tell me about your culture. And they say to me, no, I don't have a culture, I'm, I'm American. <laughs> At the end of the class, things have changed. It's important to explore and see how these backgrounds have, a, have an impact in our lives. If, if, I think that as people are able to understand that they have a culture, they will also start opening up to other people's culture. And I think that that only can happen as we address and look at each other. Culture, obviously, for me, I believe, is central. And it's like the water on this uh, aquarium. It's, um, and uh, it's not only the water, but if you look, the, if you look inside a fish, th there's also uh, water, as well as the interaction, the relationship between the, f the fish. So culture is central, and if we don't take it into account, this is, we're like a fish out of the water. Co what global cultural psychotherapy try, tries to be is to be an integrative approach that benefits from different types of psychotherapies in evidence. So we try to see that there is the individual, there is the relational, and there is the contextual. I think that if we're able to see how being in a particular place has an impact on us, how being uh, African American in Boston uh, is very different than being uh, white, it has an important effect on your life that's not only measured on your levels of avoidance. It's something that's happening out there that we need to look. And if we don't look at these factors, then we're not going to be hearing people appropriately and we're going to be missing the boat. The whole point is to capture the whole person more thoroughly so that we can actually do, we can see them and then help them more efficiently. People don't come to a second session because they don't feel heard. They don't feel, um, they, they don't feel like uh, we are seeing them. And sometimes it's because we're not seeing their cultural backgrounds, or sometimes it's because they're not seeing the individual aspects either, which are clearly important, but also relational. So that, that's like the main premise of cultural psychotherapy. It doesn't intend to be a new approach in itself. That's not what it, what it is. What it tries to do is complement CBT, DBT, by providing a context or emphasis on the psychotherapeutic relationship. I, am, I love transdiagnostics and uh, therapies. It's one of my favorite ones. And I, I think that uh, they can, you know, they're very effective. And uh, I think that if they're helpful, let's go and use them but let's keep it into account the context. It's not the same. Uh, there are things happening that we also need to uh, into account, take into account. So 
cultural understandings do impact the psychotherapeutic process. The first one that I mentioned was race and ethnicity. And it was finally, I think it's being more measured. But I think it's also, um, in, and, uh, and that has uh, led to the creation of many cultural adapted interventions. Uh, as uh, what has been found is that if you have a culturally adapted intervention, uh, in comparison uh, to one that's not adapted, it has a significant moderate effect in comparison to the non, to, to the non uh, adapted. So it does help culturally adapted interventions work uh, and make it makes things better. Um, nevertheless, if, it, if they're not adapted, they're still very helpful. They'll still have an impact. Now, more recent meta-analysis are beginning to find that if we include the cultural meanings, if we include variables like levels of how much discrimination we're feeling, our ethnic identity, uh, gender or re uh, orientation, um, then we, can make, we increase the efficacy of our interventions significantly better. There's some beautiful studies by Smith and Trimble uh, who reviewed meta-analysis uh, meta of meta-analysis. It's really amazing how the findings are consistent. The more uh, variables uh, we have that match the person, the more effective our interventions. But if we don't know, if we just assume that all our interventions are universal and they're helpful with everybody, then we may not be helping them as much as we want to. The country in which we live uh, seems pretty obvious because we're all here in the United States, but many of these interventions are quite different in different countries. And the other important thing that I want to emphasize is that 90% uh, of the psycholog psychological knowledge comes from the United States, and uh, very little comes from uh, different parts of the world. So we need to start uh, learning and using information from different parts of the world also. I, I used to get into trouble for saying this, but I'm, glad to, uh, but I'm glad that things have changed a little bit. I think that we can all learn from each other. Um, I don't think that because I'm Latino, I must only work with Latinos or uh, whites who only work with whites. As long as we have skills and culturally, cultural competence, we can all grow and develop and, and provide good treatment as long as we are aware of some differences, and as long as we have cultural competence. In fact, uh, uh, I think that sometimes the differences can be enriching and it can be a source of growth if we learn how to use them efficiently. And I'm gonna be talking about that in my workshop a little bit more. Obviously, I believe it's important to address both explicit and implicit processes. And methodologically, this means that it's not just enough to measure race ethnicity. We need to, we cannot just assume that because uh, somebody is from a specific cultural background, he is gonna be, or she is gonna be uh, uh, pre presenting some particular characteristics. We need to measure those characteristics. We need to find who they are so that we can, in fact, um, kind of develop uh, interventions that are going to be more helpful for them. I have been talking about individual, relational, and contextual, and, and also because uh, that has Im implications uh, psychotherapeutically. And, uh, and that leads to the main uh, kind of implications, we, which is the three-phased uh, psychotherapeutic model, which is basically a model uh, to kind of integrate different interventions uh, with the relationship and the context. So these are the three phases. Uh, the first one, phase one, is basically addressing the basic needs and goals, symptom reduction, and making sure that people are safe. It's more of an individualistic paradigm, if you will, and also it's, it, it encourages you to use evidence-based approaches as much as possible. So if we have an intervention that's gonna be helpful to reduce depression that has been proven to be helpful, let's use it. Let's, let's do everything we can to um, help that child get better as soon as possible. 
And um, then as we go along, let's say the child's still somewhat depressed, you start kind of having a relationship with that child. And that relationship becomes a source of information that can also enrich the whole process. That's why, but it doesn't happen, the second phase only happens after you have some sort of relationship. And so this second phase is highly influenced by the uh, interpersonal type of uh, psychotherapies, and it's highly influenced by what I was calling the relational paradigm. And the third phase, um, it's not talked about much in um, cultural and, and uh, evidence-based practices yet, but I think it's crucial to also include it in any model. Sometimes it is not enough to just address in, uh, symptoms. Sometimes it's not enough just to improve relationships. Sometimes we also need to talk about uh, helping kids change unjust environments. And believe it or not, this can be done. And that's uh, when, I'll be, when I'll be talking about my workshop, I'll be talking about how a group of African American kids and Latino kids actually were able to change the community in which I uh, work. They were able to do a lot of things to improve the levels of uh, violence, uh, to reduce the levels of violence in the community. So this is uh, the third phase. It's obviously more influenced by the contextual approaches and uh, it's uh, very important uh, so that uh, we can change uh, also the society and, and the groups. I talk about phases because each phase has specific requirements. Um, so nobody can go and start changing their community from the beginning. Uh, first, they need to, uh, the first they're going to be basically coming in because they have some issues that they want to address. They want to get, reduce their depressive levels, they want to reduce their anxiety, they want to deal with some, with some trauma. And um, only, uh, only as people start, um, and so that's usually what you do in the beginning. Uh, each phase has certain requirements, and I'll talk about those in one minute. But the idea is, that once you have met all these requirements, you can work on these three things at the same time. It's not only that you're going to be working and reducing your, uh, the, your symptoms or changing uh, your environment, you're also going to be uh, doing things uh, to uh, improve your relationships. So the first goal, the first phase focuses on addressing uh, treatment goals. So that's, they come in and we want to address what they are coming in for. And um, it's, if we don't do that, uh, they're not going to come back. Do we want to reduce their symptoms as quickly as we can? And that's why evidence-based practices are so great. But we also need to make sure they are safe. And um, we cannot uh, do much if they are not feeling, if they're at risk at any point. This is uh, another important issue, is making sure uh, that their basic needs are met. Sometimes uh, in the community I work at, a lot of kids are, don't, are not having, they're living in shelters, they're living in, uh, they're living in uh, uh, welfare, they don't have enough, enough, enough sufficient resources. So it is important also to find uh, case managers and people who can actually address these issues uh, as soon as possible. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna be doing therapy, it just means that as you are helping them get the resources, you are also learning how they cope with problems and how they're solving different issues. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. So, uh, some of the basic, um, each of these uh, strategies, uh, phases has basic strategies that I emphasize. And I'm just going to mention uh, 
one, which is the most important, one of the most important one, is that we need to really uh, listen to people's chief complaints and make sure that what they're coming in is uh, what we are gonna be providing them with. In the second phase, we're gonna be exploring, uh, acknowledging and understanding the meanings of their experiences in much more detail. We're gonna be trying to understand how um, they think and what, how they're seeing the world and we're gonna be listening to them um, significantly more, more. But we can't do this if people don't have sufficient affect regulation strategies because if they, are, if they have experienced much trauma, for example, they will dysregulate and go into, into, into really more severe um, kind of models of communicating. So I, I'm, I'm saying that it is very important that if you're gonna be, one of the requirements of this phase is that before you start talking in much more detail about their experiences, they do need to have their skills. And I think that that has been emphasized uh, much by many of the presenters over here to be able to talk about it or about their own experiences. And, uh, and some of these experiences can be poverty, can be discrimination, and it's important that we have a, uh, an open ear for these issues because sometimes we just miss them. So, so that happens. So that's the second phase. And as I was saying, uh, to reach this phase, we need to. They need to have optimal levels of affect relations and have safe and trusting rela uh, relationships with our therapist. And um, a key aspect to know that we are in the second phase is that when the kid starts, when you start sensing that it's more like a we than rather an individual, then that's kind of an indicator that uh, we're more on this second phase. It becomes, it's more, the psychotherapy becomes more than just the sum of the patient and the psychotherapy becomes something different, something else. And I find that that happens um, and sometimes after a little while, and that allows you to start talking about things that are happening in the relationship that could also be indicative or helpful in their own lives. You can see communicational patterns, interpersonal patterns that are happening in the current relationship that they're replicating uh, with their teachers or families or their parents. So it, it, it's a unique opportunity uh, when this happens because you can start really uh, exploring many more things. One of the most important aspects that happens during this phase is that we can talk only, we can start talking about race and ethnicity and differences much more efficiently. Believe it or not, I used to get again into trouble because I would say no, we do need to address differences in psychotherapy. And, uh, and, but we can't do it immediately we have to do it once we have some relationship with them and once um, they have enough skills to be able to address and, and, and disagree with us or else we're just gonna be imposing our points of views to them. So one of the most important things that I have found during this second phase is that people actually, the kids start confronting me and saying, no, Martin, they call, everybody calls me Martin. Nobody calls me, none of my patients calls me Dr. LaRoche or, uh, uh, Martin, no, I, I don't see it that way. I think that you, you uh, that's not exactly what I said to you. And that's crucial because we want them to stick up for themselves uh, and not just uh, kind of listen to what I'm saying. Of course, it's different. It's a, it's a oppositional defying kid. It's more, more to be expected. But we want, them, we want them also to be able to disagree with, with me so that they will be able to do that in different settings. So I think this being able to do that doesn't happen right away, but I do appreciate it, particularly because in the first phases of psychotherapy, I'm always kind of teaching them different skill, skills on how to manage their affect, and they might get tired of that, and they wanna present, and they might wanna show me something that's different than what I had been saying. The third phase, where am I? Uh, 
so, so I was just telling you about the second phase. Um, we once you start when once kids start talking about more what's happening in the relationship, they actually start gradually feeling more empowered. The empowerment phase. Uh, again, uh, I haven't read much about it in, in the evidence-based literature yet, and I think it's because it's really hard to measure how we actually can impact context. But I think that psychotherapy can, can have an impact, not only it can also have an impact in, in changing, improving uh, different communities in context. Um, and, I'll, and to do so, however, you need to be interested and be able to talk about it in psychotherapy. Many times I um, in psychotherapy we're told, no, just focus on the main issues. Uh, don't talk about uh, what's going on in the community. I, I, I don't think so. I think it's important to talk about what's going on in the community also, see what, uh, learn from them. And many of my adolescent kids tell me about the different gang conflicts that are going on and uh, about the threats that are going on and their fears. And I think this is very important because it has a significant impact on the way they're seeing the world. So um, I do think uh, the more we include this part of the world, the more they're gonna stay in psychotherapy and the more they're gonna be able to talk about it. So, we, but for that, we need to know and be interested uh, in knowing our cultural context we need to be able um, to kind of want to know what's happening. And uh, I think the way I see it is that the empowerment phase is more like an awakening of our desire to social uh, justice in some ways. Many people want it, but people are not aware of it because they're not talking about it. They're not, they're, it's not explicit. So once we make it explicit, we're able to actually talk about it in therapy and do things uh, to change it. If we don't see it, if we don't know it, we cannot change it. So as we talk about it in therapy, as we bring it to the forefront, we can start doing things together to see how we can change it and make things better. So I think it's, um, you know, it's helpful um, as we do so, but again, it's all about timing. It's more important to talk about it, um, I think, once the, the patient has uh, some levels of optimal affect regulation and you have a trusting relationship with them and, and often at this point psychotherapy is going on in, um, not so frequently, it's happening more, more like every three weeks or so, okay? Wow. Come along, done pretty good here. So, okay, so that gives us some time for questions and, and, uh, and comments. Question. So you said that you work a lot with Latinos. Um, I didn't hear. The, you, you, said, you mentioned that you work a lot with Latinos. Yes. Um, in Miami, we have a very big population of um, Im children of immigrants who maybe came from Cuba, Venezuela, different places. Um, but a lot of the times you might talk to them and these children don't identify as either American or Latino because they don't, they're seen as not enough of either. How would you maybe integrate this idea of not having a set culture, it's like a mix, into their therapy? Very good. And that's the whole point about talking about cultural meanings, which is that how do they make sense of their own backgrounds? You know, it could be a mix of being Venezuelan and Cuban or, or American. But it's not going to, as you say, it's not going to fit very clearly what, how we assume like the typical Latino kid should be. So what I would say to you is ask him. Ask him how he makes sense 
of his parents being from Venezuela? How does he make sense of living in the United States? How is that for him? And, uh, and see how he helps you, constru- uh, how, how he can illustrate that for you. But, I, I, but the, the key is to ask each person about it and see how they are going to be making sense. Again, my problem is all these cross-cultural books in which we are all port- portrayed in very stereotypical manner. Let's not do that to your child. Let's not do that to him. Let's see how, what he shows us about his experience. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that I've been wrestling with and trying to be more conscientious is even how we use uh, language and how language can have bias. Uh, so you heard me talking about mass violence, but even um, depending on who, the ethnicity of the perpetrator, uh, there's a lot of biases on whether it's a terrorist attack or because of mental health issues. And how do we make sure that language, even in the way we communicate, isn't expressing bias, and I don't know if you have comments or being uh, helping us as professionals be thoughtful of the way that um, sometimes uh, we phrase things can actually uh, be biased in itself. Well, I'm going to start being very broad, uh, and uh, I think that we all have biases, and uh, I think that we all should start looking into them and, and figuring it out where, how we are manifested, how we are expressing them. And uh, the basic idea of the culturally competent movement is that we start by looking at yourself and looking at your own biases and seeing how we are expressing them and why we are, where we are kind of showing them. And then we kind of, we explored also how uh, other people may have different characteristics than us and how we feel about them and what those may be, how that makes us feel. And then we start kind of more specifically imagining how we could relate and connect with people who, are, who have different characteristics than our own. And, and this is very important because sometimes we, it's not the same. We have to imagine it and sometimes it's important specifically to talk with supervisors or consultants that may help us have more specific ideas. You're asking me a broad question, so I'm staying more in the broad kind of like, but that's usually like the system. But what I'm happy to hear is for you to realize that that we all have biases. If we don't take that into account, then we're not gonna try to be better. Um, So, we, and, and one of the points of my presentation, I hope, is that culture is not only about uh, race, ethnicity, it's also about gender, gender identity. It's also about socioeconomic status, increasingly so about political affiliation. I live in Cambridge, um, and Cambridge is one of the most liberal, progressive places in the world. Um, and I'm finding myself highly influenced and then having biases. And I think it's important for me to be aware of that so that I won't be able, so I won't be replicating that in any way. We have to be open about these things because uh, it's, it takes many shapes and forms. And, it's, and we may be very good in one area, but we can never stop learning more. We gotta increase and be kind of on the alert because these biases can take many different shapes and forms. Any, okay. Over here. Hi, thank you so much for presenting um, an integrative way to think about culture. Um, I was wondering, so in phase two, where um, you're more focused on the individual and not necessarily their symptoms, I'm wondering if there's certain you know, approaches that you recommend to think about when using that phase and also, um, Wondering how you kind of specifically focus on culture um, 
in that phase, sometimes I'm wondering if there's like attachment or if you're thinking about their relationships and kind of how do you bring it back um, to that cultural piece. So, so you're asking me how I focus on culture on the individual, individualistic phase? On the relational phase? Okay. The most <laughs> culture expresses itself uh, in the relationship, uh, often in power dynamics too. That's one of the biggest ones. And uh, when we go, when we're in therapy, we often have a lot of power. And uh, I, one of the things that I, as I was saying, encourage everybody is actually to confront me and to say. I disagree with you about this, I disagree with you about that, and this is why. And I need to be, and I need to hear about that. And again, uh, sometimes when people, when I talk about how they disagree with me in some things, uh, people say, well, he's just being very oppositional. Sometimes, could be. But I think it's important for people to <laughs> express the way they see the, themselves and they see the world, and it's not for me to impose my views about how, uh, how I see the world. So I try, to, I try to kind of listen to that and encourage that so that they will be, so that they will be empowered to be able to question um, first me, and then if they have to, they'll be able to stand up in a public place and, and confront different communities and do things to, to change specific environments of their own. But it happens, it's a, psychotherapy is a unique opportunity to talk about these issues because it's a safe environment in which you can actually make, you can learn from your mistakes and, and, and kind of repair these ruptures more efficiently. Good morning. Um, my question is, being in a diverse community, especially with my culture, and I work with different parents, which you may call, they have a cultural pride. So when you deal with children with different issues, and parents are not aware of it, how do you educate those parents based on their, on their cultural pride to be able to get help for their children because it's really hard coming from such a diversity of culture. Yeah, it, it, can, it can be very challenging. And I have found it helpful um, to listen, not only talk. I found it helpful to be there with them and not just kind of bring my own perspectives. I, I, I like a lot like being empathic and accepting, and once they feel accepting, and, uh, they often open up and are more able to listen to what I have to say. Nevertheless, uh, what you're also saying is that you're right, many uh, people of color don't access mental health services, and that is a significant problem. And it's not gonna be only solved um, with uh, psychotherapy. We also need to develop policies to encourage uh, people to be more open uh, to access our, our services so that it can benefit more. But individually may not be enough, but if you have them individually, uh, I find it that um, they often have the best intentions and I try to reinforce those and, uh, and, and kind of open up new ideas as they are ready. When they meet anyone new, including me, they may feel very worried. Uh, and you have to, you know, you, you, I try to calm them and make them feel less defensive so that they can be open to uh, different ideas and suggestions. But sometimes I, you know, if they are not in that space, sometimes I have found that that's really hard to go, go through. So I prefer to take some time, personally, um, if I'm really gonna work, uh, try to do it, make a difference. But it's also not an individual issue also what you're mentioning, it's also a contextual issue. It's an access issue that um, many times different communities of color are not seeing our services in a good light. Yes.
Yes, to what extent are you familiar with Ronald Rohner's parental acceptance rejection theory? He's a multicultural psychologist in terms of how it affects uh, rejection or acceptance of children from a parental point of view and his multicultural studies. I don't know him. <laughs> All right, any other questions? If you have any questions, feel free to email me at any time.